Okay, so the presentation is on post-stroke depression. It's really the purpose of today is really to get an idea of uh, how to identify depression with your stroke patients and also what all any of us can do to help prevent it or also to intervene when we see that there are signs of depression. Okay. Um, so there are two basic parts. One is what is the depression. The second part is going to be the screening. Okay, so I'm going to try I have to fit it all in within half an hour. So I'm going to try as best I can. Uh, what is post-stroke depression? It really is, it's a depression, just like any other depression that has a lot of the same symptoms. But what's different with this one is that it's a feeling of sadness and hopelessness that interferes with functioning. Okay, and unfortunately, it also, because I'm talking about at a rehab hospital, a lot of times this depression is severe enough that it impacts their rehab and it makes it difficult for them to return home, okay, or to return uh, to improve as they had been improving. Okay, what percentage, a quick question, what percentage of stroke survivors do you guys think um, suffer from post stroke depression? C. Yeah, it's C. Yeah, you're right. Okay, so about it's a very broad range, 25 to 75 percent. But what it, it goes to show that in a, on a unit of 24 stroke patients, for example, I don't think you guys have 24 stroke patients, but if you were to have 24, about six to 18 of them might actually have depression. Okay, so it's a good number. It just goes to show that we always have to be aware when we have our patients that there's a high chance that they might be suffering, if not now, maybe later on, uh, from depression. Okay, some quick, quick questions. Unfortunately, I have to go quickly, but. Um, Stroke, post-stroke depression, is it under-recognized by most healthcare workers? True or false? True. 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 Okay, well, there are the answers. Uh, maybe I'll go back. Okay, so does it only happen to people who have a massive stroke? False. True or false? Uh, people with uh, depression, do they show less recovery from functional impairments compared to those who do not have? True. 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 Yeah. Uh, and can it set in weeks, months, or even years after a stroke? True. So it can set in while the patient is in rehab, but at the same time, once they get home, it can also be something that they're faced with two, two years later on, for example. Okay, and symptoms of depression, of stroke and depression, can they be similar? Can yes. they overlap? Okay, and that I'll get into a little bit. That's what makes it a little bit harder for you guys and for us to, to notice uh, if someone has depression or not. All old people get depression. It's only natural. No, uh, and many studies show a link between cognitive problems and depression and post-stroke depression. Okay, so you guys were right on the ball. Okay, now what causes it? There are two main theories, but I'll kind of focus more on the second one. What's really shown in the literature to be kind of the main cause is that these are people who have suffered a huge loss. They're dealing uh, with, they're coping with that. Okay, so all the challenges that they now have, the fact that they're not able to do a lot of their things, that causes them to feel this depression. And like I said, it can set in at the beginning or it can set in later on. Okay, and yeah, they have, as I mentioned, a lot of loss of their social roles, of their goals, of who they are. Well, I didn't change. About the whole situation, There's so many different ways somebody can react, and sometimes as uh, professionals, we forget a little bit of what they're going through. Um, sorry, I can't, uh, I didn't change the color for that, but I'll read it. Depression is caused in part by certain life goals which become unfeasible, but which a person cannot abandon, resulting in reflection on lost goals. Okay, so they're, they're losing a lot of what they were able to do before. Okay, so this is uh, a, um, uh, what's the word, a testimonial from somebody who did suffer from depression. I'll read it out loud. Depression really hit me when I returned home after rehab. Three months ago, I had walked around here. He's talking about in his house. Okay, he had walked around, fixed things, and mowed the lawn. I soon found I would have to depend on other people for things as simple as changing a light bulb. Okay, again, reality might hit them later on once they get home or when they're here and they realize they need help of a PAB every single time they get dressed. I'm going to skip through um, because, uh, unfortunately, because of time. So the consequences are, uh, as I already mentioned, right, dec decreased quality of life, they are not uh, benefiting as much from their rehab, so they might be staying here longer, okay? They might not even, their place of discharge could be different if they have depression versus somebody who does not have depression, okay? They do, they are at risk for more hospital visits, higher healthcare costs, of course, because if they're staying longer and they're using more resources, um, that affects the cost, and they do have a risk of suicide. Okay, now why are we having these sessions? It's really to help all of us detect depression better. The earlier we detect, the quicker we can intervene, the better it is for the patient. Okay, and detecting it as early as acute care or as early as rehab is still very beneficial for the patients. 
So here are some signs and symptoms, okay? Um, nothing new for you guys, I'm sure, right? Depressed mood, a loss of interest in activities, changes in appetite or weight. Okay, I know that nurses, you guys weigh the patients quite often. There's a dietitian who's involved often with feeding and how much a person is eating. Uh, sleep disturbances. Again, PABs can be coming, I can see the patient during, uh, while they're sleeping and you can notice that there's some disturbances. Uh, slow movements, fatigue, irritability, uh, feelings of worthlessness or guilt, decreased concentration and memory, and suicidal thoughts. Okay? Really nothing, um, I'm sure nothing is surprising here for you guys. Uh, risk factors, uh, massive stroke is a risk factor. It's not the only way, it's not that every person with a massive stroke has depression or only depression happens to people who have a massive stroke, but it's a risk factor. Uh, female, uh, having depression before and cognitive barriers, communication barriers, okay? And as uh, I mentioned before, that it's difficult to detect in our clients because a lot of times they, have, they suffer from a stroke, so a lot of times they have other symptoms already that might mask the depression. So I'm going to throw the question out to you and I'll repeat it, your answers. Uh, have you thought of any of your patients kind of in the last while, even today or the last week, who have said something that right now you might think, well, maybe they might have a depression or who have done something that, you know, brings the question of uh, possible depression. Any patient in therapy uh, while you go in their room and you see them? Um, well, yeah, if someone doesn't, doesn't want to get out of bed. If someone doesn't want to get out of bed, yeah. Yeah, exactly. So I'm sure like a nurse can see that, a PAB can see that, even OTs or when we do our dysphagia assessments too, we can see that this person's not eating. Um, so I'm not typing it, but I would have typed that. And they cry, yeah, definitely. And you see that a lot? You, but you do see it, huh? On the, on the unit. So you'll see someone who cries. Um, physio, we might, a physio might see a patient who's not coming down anymore, but they used to be coming down. Okay, so those are some changes. The PABs, if you do a walking program with the patient, maybe you notice that they're not walking as much or they're not willing to walk as much. Um, they might be having more trouble getting out of bed and you're trying to do a transfer with them, but they're not getting out. Um, nurses might see that the patient, like I mentioned, isn't eating as well or is distraught. Okay, so these are just some examples um, of what they could say. Okay, a lot of it has to do with changes in their role, feeling that it's very difficult now to do things that they were once able to do. Okay, and um, why is all this important? Okay, we talked about symptoms. We talked about, uh, and now I want to kind of get into what your role and what all of our role is. It's important because it's actually treatable. Okay, it's not somebody who, like, if you get depression, you're kind of doomed. You know, if you have depression, even in an institution like this, where we're not like a psychiatric institution, we still have some skills and some ways that we can treat and intervene in depression as soon as possible. Okay, here are some basic ways. Again, it's not very relevant to all of us here. Medication, so the nurses and doctors, pharmacists. Once we notice someone is depressed, we could refer uh, meds for them. Uh, Talk-based therapy, we do have a, psycho we have a neuropsychologist okay, on the team and an educator as well, so social workers too. Um, physical exercise, there are, the, these things are not so relevant, like I mentioned, but it, the point is just to say that there are ways to treat it. So if not here, then maybe when they get in the community. Okay, and these are tips for the patient. If a patient is suffering from post-stroke depression, there are things that they can do, okay? Uh, what I'm gonna just touch on quickly is, I guess, these three because improved nutrition, this is what's found in the literature, I don't know if the nutritionist can attest to it or not, but uh, even changing a little bit of their food could have an impact. Okay, so if we notice signs and symptoms, it's like a, a, a team effort, that if the whole team is aware, then maybe some small changes can be made to help the patient. Attend a stroke support group. Okay, I know we had talked about having one, I don't think we have one at this point but it's definitely something that can be done in inpatient rehab and relaxation techniques. Okay, that too, I think that there is something going on uh, in inpatient rehab. We have someone who's working on that now. Okay, so the whole point is to say there are ways to intervene and it's an interdisciplinary approach. Okay, and this is more things that can, uh, a patient can do in the community. 
Okay, so what's our role? Keep your eyes open for signs and symptoms of depression. Okay, so I'll throw the question out there. Let's just say you are a PEB and you're going into the patient's room and you see that they're, they're crying, okay? We don't automatically say this person has depression. Like that's, it's a thin, like it's a tough kind of line between being too cautious and not being cautious enough. So these are patients who suffered a loss, they had stroke, just because they're crying doesn't mean they have depression, but we want to be aware. Okay, so what would you do if you do see that and you see it happens multiple times with the same patient? Perfect. <laughs> Tell your nurse. It's that simple, okay? All this half hour is really to say if you see somebody who shows signs of depression, you tell your nurse, okay? And the nurses, I'll tell you, I'll, I'll explain what is uh, the next step, okay? If it's a physio, an OT, a nutrition, anyone else who sees signs of depression, we can tell the nurse and we usually discuss it in rounds, okay? We can communicate, okay? And when I say communicate, I don't mean give advice because a lot of us have a tendency, I have a tendency to do that a lot, is just give advice, give advice. So what, instead, it's really to, be lis to, to listen, to apply these active listening techniques, okay? It means we don't have to talk necessarily, but we want to hear what they, what they have. We can, it's okay to say, look, there is something called post-stroke depression that happens to a lot of people. And we can, you know, if you want to talk about it, we can talk about it, okay? So it's okay to, to talk about depression with our patients. Um, but the best way is really to just listen to them. And as I mentioned, inform the nurse, okay? And we can tell the patient that we will be informing, uh, informing the nurse. Okay, and in addition, uh, I don't know if you guys know, but do you guys know that the OTs do uh, screening? Okay, so when every patient comes, the OT has been assigned this lovely task of doing uh, a screening a quick screening of depression for each patient who has a stroke, okay? It takes about two minutes, um, nothing complicated, but at least at the end of it, the results are written in the assessment booklet so everybody can have an idea of what the level of depression is. Again, I'm not, it's not saying that we're diagnosing depression because we're not, it is using the screening tool to kind of gauge the potential um, severity of a depression. Okay, so we're really done the first part. The second part is super quick. Um, it's a little bit more for the OTs, and since there are none here, I can really like just skim through it quickly. Uh, the tool that they are using, okay, is uh, the PHQ-9, Post uh, Patient Health Questionnaire 9. Patient, yeah. Uh, it is very short. It's used to diagnose depression, not only post-stroke depression, but depression with many patients. Okay, it has a lot, uh, it's based on the DSM-4, it has um, a lot of positives, okay, which is it's short, easy, you don't need training to do it, uh, it can be done with many patients, it comes in a lot of languages, but the challenging part, does anybody know what the challenging part could be with our stroke patients, if you do a questionnaire? Yeah, so a lot of times they do have trouble either cognitively or they can't speak, okay, so yes, you can self-administer it, but there's challenges. So that's one of the negative things, okay? How long does it take? Super short, two minutes. It can be self-administered or you can, we can ask the questions verbally. So a lot of OTs might just want to give it to the patient and leave and then come back after like five minutes and then we can discuss the results with them. Okay, all you need is a paper and a pen. It has good psychometric properties, the languages. This is a tool, okay? I'm showing it because, yes, the OTs are the ones that should be doing the screening, but at the same time, a nurse, if you notice that someone has signs of depression and the screening was done like two weeks ago, you also are able, more than able to, uh, to do the tool yourself if you'd like. It doesn't take long and it's simple. So you can ask these questions. The higher the score, the more likely somebody is to have depression or the more severe the depression could be. Okay, and one of the important questions that are asked are uh, thoughts that you would be better off dead or hurting yourself in some way. Okay, it could be sometimes a very awkward question to ask, um, but if that, that's a huge red flag. So if we do see that somebody responds yes to that, there are, we have to take it very seriously. Okay, so I'll kind of show you what needs to be done because I have, I think, five minutes left. Uh, so interpreting the score, as I mentioned, the higher the score, the more severe the depression. And this is found like in guidelines about the tool itself. It kind of says what should be done. Okay, so once it gets to 15 or higher, the OT will write that down 
or the nurse or whoever does it will write that in the assessment booklet and then you'll kind of know what to do. Should we be doing active treatment? Should we uh, be in immediately contacting the pharmacist, uh, immediately talking about medication change, uh, psychotherapy, okay? If it's less than that, we just kind of talk to the patient about it and say, look, this is depression happens with patients. Um, uh, we're going to keep monitoring. Let us know if you feel um, depressed later on or if you feel down. Okay? So basically, uh, it's measuring the severity, right? There is one at 2.30. It's okay. Don't worry. There's one at 2.30. So um, this is just, again, suggesting we do not diagnose. Okay, we're, we're not uh, psychologists. And uh, okay, that's partly, that just goes with the scoring. So like I said, I won't get into that too much uh, here. This is the, the protocol. This is where uh, uh, you guys really, I mean, it makes it a lot easier for everybody to understand. I'm gonna focus on this part first. Everyone keeps an eye out for someone with depression. Okay, everybody's role. Okay, whether you're a nurse, you're a PB, even housekeeping, anybody can notice if there's depression. What do you do if you notice it? Report. So you tell the nurse, okay? The nurse talks to the, pa talks to the patient and documents. The nurse can document it, okay? As long as the nurse says, informed by so-and-so that a patient might be depressed or signs of depression, and then when you get the chance to talk to the patient, you can note that down, okay? And then it's always going to be discussed in rounds. And once it's discussed in rounds, that's when the whole team can decide what to do next. But the whole point, it's not going to be, it should be discussed systematically, but if it's not noticed by anyone, once it comes to rounds, we're kind of going to say, okay, you know, we're going to pass over it. But if someone has said, you know what, the PAB did come to me and tell me that the patient was crying a lot, then it can be discussed as a team approach as what to do. Okay, for those that don't know, rounds is our meeting that we have once a week on patients um, discussing the patient. Each patient is discussed once a week, I believe. Right? Each patient once a week? Every two weeks. It's been a while. <laughs> Every two weeks. Okay, so this is more for the OTs. Okay, the OTs or any uh, nurse or even the SLP who's going to be doing this, the screening. If the score is a low score, really low, I didn't put it here, we do nothing. If the score is 10 to 14, we tell the patient's nurse again and document. So there's a lot of communication going on. Whoever does the screening tells the nurse and we discuss in rounds. Okay? If uh, whoever notices something tells the nurse. So sorry nurses, there's a lot maybe, there's not too much more to do because it's just that you are aware and then discuss it in rounds. Okay, so however, if the score is really high, as an OT, we should be telling the psychologist, neuropsychologist as well. Uh, and if it's really high and there's actually a risk of suicide, we would be talking to the doctor immediately, okay? And like, then once it's discussed in rounds, there are many different things that could be done. We have social workers, we have recreational therapists, we have educators, uh, we have, uh, I said neuropsychologists, we have doctors who can prescribe medication if need be. Uh, and hopefully we're going to be trying to get more support, more, I know there's a music therapist, so there's a lot of things that maybe can be done to intervene. There's a question, yeah. Who tells me what the score is? It's written. Technically, it should be written in the assessment booklet. Okay. Okay, and it'll be discussed again in rounds. So the OT, when they do the uh, evaluation, should, the screening should be telling you what the score is. Okay, and that's why I explained kind of what the score is, so you'll know. It's not just going to be a number. Okay, it's a five. What does that mean? Hopefully, you'll know that a five means it's no big deal. Um, we'll monitor, okay, um, but you'll know that a higher number means it's more uh, urgent. Okay, this is the same thing. It's a bit more specific for the OTs. Uh, so I could just print a copy and send it to them. It's just a little bit more about what interventions can be done for, um, depending on the score. Okay, OTs will re usually do it within the first 72 hours of admission. And we want to do it when there's a good rapport with the patient. We're not really going to do it when the first time we see the patient. Um, we want to explain the purpose, um, tell the patient about depression. Like I mentioned before, we're not going to shy away from talking about it. We do want them to know why we're doing the assessment, okay? And we want to write down the results in the booklet, okay? Uh, this, again, is a bit more, well, this can be for anyone. Like, if you do notice it, do you guys feel comfortable talking to the patient about it? If you notice signs of depression, 
Okay, so it's sometimes I put this on there because there are some maybe newer tech, uh, newer um, staff members that have voice that they do feel a little uncomfortable with it. Uh, so it's just kind of to help you guys. If you do, if the patient does have a high score, um, you can ask her, talk about it to the patient and say, hey, do you want to see somebody? We have this, this, this in the service. It's normal. It happens to many people. Okay, uh, and if it happens during therapy, it's the same idea. You know, you could say, look, I notice that you are showing me signs of, of sadness. I don't mean to say you have depression, but these are, this is something that could happen to a lot of patients. Do you want me to talk to the nurse about it? Do you want me to talk to the neuropsychologist about it? Okay, if somebody has communication problems, uh, we can always have a, a little bit of help from our speech language pathologist. Okay, so I do have a short video that I'll show you, uh, and that's about it. Any questions? How do I access the video then? Mr. Elliot, how are you doing? I don't know. I, I just can't seem to fall asleep. I'm always tired. This is the second night that you've been quite agitated. What's on your mind? I don't know what's wrong. I mean, I, I, I'm in bed all day long and I can't sleep. Mm -hmm. <laughs> You'd think I'd be able to sleep at night. It would be easy, but no. There's probably a lot on your mind. Yeah, a lot on my mind. Yeah. You know, before I got the stroke, mm -hmm. I, I was working. I mean, I used to be a teacher and I read all those books and now I, I just can't remember. My wife, she, um, she just retired, but she has a very little pension and she can't drive. Mm -hmm. So she, um, she has to get the kids to come over to visit me. Right. And I know I'm a burden to them. I mean, they have their own lives. They have their own children. Oh. Your I, family cares for you. They want to be around you and support you. Since there's so much happening, so many hard changes that you're contending with, perhaps you would like to speak to our counselor. Do you think I... I would be a burden to her. Oh, that's what the psychologist does. You know, she helps people with this very hard transition. I'll arrange an appointment for you for tomorrow to see her. Okay. In the meantime, I want you to have a good night's sleep. Okay, sir? Okay. So that was Cheryl, one of our best OTs. Um, so what did you guys notice about uh, signs of depression? What did you notice about the man? Frustrated. Yeah, frustrated, couldn't sleep. Crying. Crying, his, he was crying. He was talking about being a burden, right? Yeah. So very, nothing like surprising, right? Nothing too difficult. And her approach was, was excellent. Obviously, she's a very trained, uh, I gave her a script, but she just like went along. 
um, very empathetic. Um, and it turned out she could see this, the patient could see the psychologist the next day, which was very exciting. But the point that doesn't happen in real life, but the point is that she just kind of talked about it and said, didn't ignore it and just said, look, it's possible that there is something going on. I have a psychologist. The patient was very open to it. Sometimes the patient might not be. And obviously we don't push, but we, we breach the subject and see what goes from there, what happens from there. So I'm going to stop because I think time is up. But thank you. Thank you.